please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Megan Moreno. Thank you all so much for being here and thank you for that introduction. It's really my privilege to be here with you tonight and share this time to talk about the intersection of adolescent health and social media. As you heard by way of introduction, I'm an investigator, I'm an associate professor, and I'm also a practicing adolescent medicine physician. My research team, the Social Media and Adolescent Health Research Team, has the mission of advancing society's understanding of the relationships between media and adolescent health towards educating adolescents and their families, providing better health care for teens, and developing innovations in adolescent health. Our work focuses in three core areas, thus our vision is to provide education to adolescents and families towards safe internet use, which is represented by our internet safety core area, to develop tools to assess internet use and define problematic internet use in our measuring technology use and misuse core, and to both create and interpret messages within social media to promote healthy behaviors. And most of what I'll be talking about tonight is within that core area. As an outline for our journey this evening, I'd like to begin by centering our discussions and thoughts on some key areas of adolescent health. I'd then like to think a little bit about the current state of the landscape of social media, and then dive into the intersection of where those two meet, and focus on four key areas where we can use what we learn from media to understand adolescents, and use what we know about adolescents to inform how we think about media. And those areas are observation of social media, associations between what's online and what's offline, the influence of social media, and opportunities for intervention. So starting out thinking about key adolescent health issues, can anyone shout out for me, what are the three most common causes of morbidity and mortality for adolescents in the US? Suicide, I heard. Automobiles, I heard. Injury. Drug overdose, I heard. One more. Guns, I heard. So excellent. This slide represents the three most common causes of morbidity and mortality for adolescents in the US. Accidents, particularly motor vehicle accidents, homicide, and suicide. Those are the three things that kill teens in our country. Accidents, homicide, and suicide. All of those are related to behaviors. All of those are related to decisions. All of those are preventable. But some of what we need to do in thinking about preventing these causes of morbidity and mortality is to understand clues that we can recognize ahead of time to try to prevent these. So where might these clues come from? Well, there's been decades of research in adolescent health that have shown that certain precursor behaviors, health risk behaviors, can be indicators that an adolescent is more likely to be at risk for morbidity and mortality. Those include substance use, risky sexual behavior. There are also health conditions that can place adolescents at increased risk for those causes of morbidity and mortality. And that includes depression, eating disorders, other illnesses. And so where does social media fit in? A big question that my team spends a lot of time on is can social media offer new opportunities for the early identification of these problems, for intervention, for prevention? And so if we consider the social media landscape, which today is vast, and by the time I put this, this downloaded icon from Google up here, it's probably up to date or out of date. It's vast. There's so many sites, they come and go. And so how can we think about some of the key characteristics that bind these sites together? And I think there's a few of them that we would agree are pretty common among most all of what we would call social media. A first characteristic is that social media is interactive media. Users can create as well as consume media. And as one of my patients once said to me, you can talk as well as listen. And I think that's best understood by contrasting social media to some more traditional, or if you want, you can use the word vintage, types of media that are shown in this slide. And in these types of media, such as the television, for example, what we relied on was companies and corporations to create a message, to create a story, and then send it in a single direction from them to you. What we see in social media is that it's more of a conversation. As a viewer, you can also go online and provide comments and interact and make your own content and post it on YouTube. So it's more of an interaction. 
Social me media is also immensely popular, as I know most of you know. Over 90% of adolescents use it, over 75% of adults use it. And what I'd love to know is for you all in the audience, if you could raise your hand if you use some type of social media. Not surprising for this audience, but keep it up for a minute. Now, the most popular site still, even though they're already feeling retro, is Facebook and Twitter. So keep your hand up if you use either Facebook or Twitter. And then keep your hand up if you use both. So what we're seeing as one of the newer trends is the idea of using multiple social me media platforms. And this is really the norm among adolescents. We used to debate our adolescents on MySpace or Facebook. It was always an or question. And we've gone from either or to both and. So adolescents are using multiple sites in diverse ways. And the one way that I could convince my parents to understand this was to make the analogy to a, a stock portfolio. They maintain a portfolio of social media sites that they rely on for different things at different times and use in different ways. Social media is also pervasive. You see it everywhere. You see it on the airplane. You see it people walking in the airport, as many of you did today, and maybe got people bumping into you because they weren't looking up. They were looking at their phones. One of the things I love about this picture is these two folks are friends, but they're not interacting at all. They're each interacting with their screen. And this young man is a real go-getter because he's making a call and texting someone on two separate phones. So it's everywhere. Social media is also incredibly persuasive. Stanford professor B.J. Fogg coined the term mass interpersonal persuasion, the idea that social media could convince an entire audience of people, but in very personal ways, with very tailored messages and nudges. And social media is also a way that things that used to be very personal to many of us, possibly buried in a college photo album somewhere you hope people won't find, and now it's out there in a very public setting where it's going to remain probably for as long as the internet remains. So what sort of research opportunities does social media provide us to improve adolescent health? Observation, association, influence, and intervention will be the ones that I'll focus on today. And for each of these, we'll talk a little bit about what kinds of information we can learn. And I'll provide some example studies. Observation is the area where there's been the most research. And I want to take you a little bit deeper beyond the idea of just looking to think about what can we do with social media that we couldn't do before? What are the unique ways that we can observe adolescents and understand more about the developmental effects of media, about their hopes, their dreams, their views, their health? And there's four listed here that I'd like to talk through. The first is health and risk behavior displays individual patterns over time, displays within peer groups, and then going to that 10,000 foot level and thinking about displays on social media at more of the population level. So first thinking about health and risk behavior displays, and I'll bring up a study that we did. It was one of our earliest studies and probably is a little vintage itself. And this was a study of one of the initial very popular websites, uh, MySpace. And on this site, what we did was we observed randomly selected profiles of 18-year-olds, and we viewed one year of content. And we were interested in how many adolescents chose to represent on this public site health risk behaviors. So as you can see, about 41% of those profile owners chose to represent references to substance use behaviors one or more times in a one-year period. And most common was alcohol use, but also tobacco and drugs about a quarter of these profile owners chose to represent references to sexual behavior, sexual um, attitudes, sexual intentions on their profiles. About 14% made references to violence. And when we looked across the whole sample, about half of the profiles referenced one or more of these types of health risk behaviors. So how do these references look? What does it look like? Well, we know this is online, so we know that some of these references are by text. So here you can see different categories of references and some examples from our data of text references that were within that study sample.
But some adolescents don't want to display through text, and they want to use the multimedia components of social media to really express themselves. And one thing that's popular in social media, as many of you know, is the ability to take other people's content and rebrand it on your own site. And so we've seen this over time. On MySpace, the glittering cherries were popular. Then on Facebook, we went through a phase of bumper stickers that were very popular, downloaded icons, which are often very catchy and really portray certain risk behaviors as a very desirable and linked to commercial types of, of uh, products. And now we've seen the rise of the meme. And all of these are ways that adolescents can choose to represent views or attitudes, things they're thinking about or thinking about doing or are doing in these very creative ways. And then these sites also let us see uh, people's photographs. That's another way that adolescents can express what they're thinking about, what they're doing, what's happening in that moment. So we can see that there's really rich and contextual data that we can gather from these sites. But it's one thing to look at these health risk behaviors over time, but one of the things that social media gives us a lot of power to do is understand people's displayed behaviors or thoughts over time. And in this study, what we were interested in is how adolescents represented depression symptoms over a time period. And so for this study, we defined a depression symptom reference as consistent with the dsm 4 criteria for major depressive disorder. So the stated text needed to be consistent with what's in our treasured psychology psychiatry text that defines depression symptoms. And so an example would be depressed mood or feeling hopeless. And in this study, we observed our participants over a year. And within that year, we were interested in participants whose displays were consistent with the criteria for a major depressive episode, which is having five of nine symptoms in a two-week period. So what I'd like to show is those participants who displayed five of nine depression symptoms on Facebook in a two-week period over that year. So on this graph, you see on the y-axis the total number of depression symptom references in that particular month. Down below, you see our five participants who met that criteria. And over here, you see the timeline of which month it was. And what we can see here is that for participant one, there were some depression symptom references in July, none in August, an escalating number in September, and a peak of the number of depression symptom references they chose to display on Facebook in August. Then we see it calms down in November, and then we see a little bit of a peak again in January. And you can see for each of these participants, their pattern of how many depression symptom references they chose to display on Facebook varies over time. But on the whole, this graph looks pretty similar to what we often see in clinic, which is that depression symptoms wax and wane, they get worse, they peak, they get better. And so to us, this was a powerful illustration of using social media tools to observe when an adolescent might really be struggling, right? M might really be getting into trouble and might benefit from a clinical visit. So I'm not making the case that this graph suggests a diagnostic tool. I think what it suggests is a way to identify those clues about when an adolescent is at increased risk for morbidity and mortality. Now, these displays do not take place in a vacuum. They take place within peer groups. And so another interesting thing about observing adolescents on, on social media is that we can also observe their peer groups and who they choose to interact with and what they choose to interact about. In this study, we were interested in eating disorders. And we were interested in how people who are pro-ED, who put content out, supporting what they would call an eating disorder lifestyle, whether or not they use social media tools to interact with other adolescents and deepen that identity and that, that commitment to disordered eating. And this is a study that was led by Alina Arsenev, who's at UCLA now. In this study, we identified 45 pro-ED Twitter accounts as egos, and an example of a pro-ED Twitter handle would be at goal weight zero. So these handles can usually be identified by what the handle name is and whether it reflects that eating disorder identity. And in this study, we looked at their content as well as that of their followers. So 45 egos and then a sample of their followers. And what we found was that these, these handles in general had about a median of 173 followers. So not Lady Gaga, but not two followers either. 
And about 44% of the pro-ED profiles followers also recognized and demonstrated themselves as being pro-eating disorder. And so being that this is a Twitter study, we couldn't resist the conclusion that on our study, it looked as though birds of a feather flocked together. And I think you can imagine extrapolating to other adolescent health risk behaviors and conditions. Right now we're looking at the self-harm community, for example, and seeing how these communities can be built around behaviors that are not always healthy and reinforced as a socially normative behavior. Now, so far we've been talking about the experience of the adolescent. Let's think a little bit about going to the population level. In this study, we were interested in uh, some of the discourse that was happening on social media around the legalization of marijuana, which happened in Washington State in 2012, as many of you know. So the social movement and debate was very prominent on social media. We had people asking us in clinic to verify things that they were seeing on social media and either endorse it or refute it. It was a very hot topic. And so what we were interested in doing is looking at how that social media dialogue was going. And so what we looked at was 50 YouTube videos. And we selected videos that were pro-legalization, anti-legalization, and just neutral information about legalization. And we selected about equal numbers of each. And we analyzed all of the comments, 892 of the comments. Um, and after our PTSD was done from that, we had these categories of subjects that the comments to the videos fell into. And you can see there's a wide subject spread. People talked about the effects on the economy. People talked about the legal aspects of legalization. People talked about the politics, about religion, about worries about danger, worries about crime. They compared marijuana to coffee, to alcohol, to tobacco. There was a wide subject spread. But where there was consistency was that 88% of all of those 892 comments were positive against marijuana. And in one particular category, attack on opinion, which you could also view as trolling, in that category, 91% of these comments were attacking anyone that brought up a negative or a questioning view about marijuana. So to us, this really gave us insights into the landscape of the discourse about this really important topic of legalization and helped us understand that there weren't all players at the table as part of this conversation. So what I've shown you through observational studies is we can understand the epidemiology of displays for a particular behavior or on a particular social media site. We can understand patterns of the display over time or by location or by an individual. We can understand the social context of those displays or the social response to those displays as well as understanding public opinion or sentiment trends. There's a lot of really neat methodologies that are continuing to evolve. There's different methods for different questions, content analysis, big data, people are starting to crowdsource. So it's an exciting time to think about what might be next. Now let's think a little bit about associations between this online display and offline behavior because it's one thing to understand what's out there, but it's a whole nother question to understand what it means. And I think the real key question is, what does that displayed social media behavior mean to the individual who displays it? And I think our thinking around this started in the 1990s, really centered on this cartoon. And it says, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. So there was this skepticism about that, well, if someone puts something online, it's not real. It's a fabricated version of themselves. And I love the way this cartoon has evolved. So it says, here on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, but now, this guy says, our metadata analysis indicates he is definitely a brown lab. He lives with a white and black spotted beagle mix, and I suspect they are humping. So we've come to this place where we understand that it's real and that we understand that we can get more information from it than the viewer probably even intended us to do so. Our studies in this area have focused on alcohol, on depression, and on sex. These are areas that we selected because of their links to morbidity and mortality for adolescents. These are also areas where pediatricians are often loath to do screening or do discussions in the clinic settings. So our hope was that if there are associations between online displays and offline behaviors, we might be able to find some novel ways to identify folks at risk. In these studies, we've used a pretty similar study design. So we recruit a study population, and for now we'll imagine that you're our study population. 
And after you've consented and agreed to be in our study, we evaluate your Facebook profiles. And we categorize you. Let's say that this rowdy bunch over here in the corner are displayers. They display references to alcohol. They went to the pub before they came here. And we can categorize them as having alcohol displays on their profile like this gentleman. This side of the room is this type of displayer, very studious. They go out with their friends. But they don't post about alcohol on, on Facebook. And so what we would do next is give all of you in the audience an alcohol screen that's clinically validated, the same one that we use in our clinics, the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. And what we'd want to know is, is if this half of the room is scoring more at risk for alcohol than this half of the room. Or is this half of the room hiding everything and they're going to score higher? Or is there really no difference? And in our alcohol-based study, our findings were that looking at this alcohol use disorders identification score with the cutoff for problem drinking being at eight, we found that our non-displayers here scored well below that cutoff. Participants who displayed references to alcohol use scored higher, but not at the cutoff. And it was really the participants who displayed references on Facebook to what we called IPD, intoxication or problem drinking behaviors. These were the participants who displayed, I have no idea how I got home last night or displayed, I didn't make it to the football game because I spent the whole time in the drunk tank. People who displayed those references were the group that was most likely to score into that at-risk category. And when we look at it the flip way, who scored at risk, about 58% of the intoxication and problem drinking displayers scored as at risk, compared to much fewer numbers of alcohol and non-displayers. So let's shift a little bit and think about the perspective of the viewer. So we've talked about the displayers. We've talked about the patterns we can observe. What about the viewers? What about the adolescents who observe these types of displays? And we can draw from literature that tells us that traditional influences on teen behavior include peers in the media. We know that studies have shown that perception of peer use is among the strongest predictors of substance use and of initiation of sexual activity. And similarly, we know from decades of previous research that seeing representations of substance use or sex in media, such as television and movies, are also associated with initiation of behaviors. So one of the ways that we think about social media is that it's peer-generated media. It's a way to be able to see the people you look up to, what they're doing, but it's an achievable goal. It's the person who has the locker three down from you. It's not Lindsay Lohan, where you're probably never going to meet her it's someone that you know and someone that's an achievable role model. And so we've wondered a lot about what are the pathways that convey influence in social media. And one of some of the studies that have been done so far suggests there is an influence, but it's hard to know what that influence is. So one study found that teens felt that representations of alcohol on social media were believable and worried that they would influence younger teens. Not themselves, of course, but younger teens might be influenced by this. And in another brilliant study by Dr. Dana Litt, found that teens who viewed alcohol references on profiles of peers stated they were more interested in trying alcohol. But the hard thing is, is that, again, coming back to how is it, comp how is it influential, and I love to quote um, the brilliant scholar Dana Boyd that it's complicated. And this was, uh, what, the study I'm going to show you is one of the more complicated ones we did. We were interested in understanding how social media, especially Facebook, might be influential. And so we worked with groups of teens, parents, providers, and researchers to generate a list that items from that list are seen on this side of the diagram. And by the time we had made it through all interviewing and talking with all of our participants, we had about 600 items on that list. Then we went back to those participants and we asked them to group the list items into clusters. Group them so that similar items are together. And these cluster labels represent the names of the groups that represent these items. And then we could loosely sort those into larger domains of connection, identification, comparison. So by the end of the study, we felt like we had this very rich but unwieldy understanding of all the ways in which Facebook might be influential. And in showing this to one of our adolescent participants and asking them for their take on this graph, she said, you know, 
really what it is is that Facebook influences us in all the ways that the regular world does, except everything moves faster and burns brighter. And I thought, oh, we should have just done a study with just you. <laughs> so I think this raises, it's really just the beginning of our understanding. I think there's future research questions out there that might include, include how do we integrate our understanding of social media into the existing behavioral models that we use every day in our research? And then how do we think about using social media to promote healthy behaviors? And I think that's a nice jumping off point to think about our final area of research of interventions. So what can we do with interventions with social media? And I would argue that we have two main choices. One choice is we can take social media and integrate it into existing successful interventions. So maybe you sign up for a tobacco intervention to quit smoking and you go and meet with a counselor and you get some brochures and you have some motivational interviewing and we can add a Facebook group to that and maybe the Facebook group will help. So I think that's one model. I think our second model and something I think we can challenge ourselves with is how do we develop novel interventions that are really built around the power and the tools of social media and build those into the infrastructure from the ground up. And I think for that, we can think about how to make interventions targeted. We can think about mass interpersonal communication that BJ Fogg talks about. And we can think about partnering with folks in PR and communication and advertising that already know that in my target age range and with the pictures that I posted on Facebook, they should probably send me ads about minivans. Someone out there knows how to work these algorithms and I think we can think about partnering with them to be able to develop really novel new interventions. And the good news is I think we can gain insights into what natural interventions are taking place with the youth among us. And for this, I'd like to think about a project that I was really privileged to be part of where they had a panel of teen and young adult cancer survivors who were interviewed about the role of social media during their diagnosis, their treatment, and their recovery. And this is our lovely panel. And as they were interviewed, a few themes in how they use social media emerged. The first theme was information distribution. And a quote from a young woman was, I was diagnosed with cancer on vacation. I went to Florida for spring break and ended up in the hospital being told I had a brain tumor. I had a suitcase full of bathing suits and no family around. And I was headed into a 14 hour surgery. I needed to get information out there fast so people would know what was happening and how to help. I used Facebook. So she described that she put a single status update on Facebook. That was all she had time for. She was taken back for the OR. 20 hours later, she ended up in a hospital room and her entire family was there. A second theme is the idea of social connection. So here's a quote from a participant. I was in active treatment and inpatient isolation for 28 days. 28 days alone in a room. I used Facebook and Twitter to keep up with friends so that I didn't feel so isolated. Another similar theme, given that these are young adults and adolescents, this one says, when I was diagnosed, I was 19, but I was sent to a children's hospital. I felt so alone there, surrounded by little kids. I used social media to stay in touch with people my age. And a final theme, one of my favorites, was this idea of support from unlikely places. And this young woman said, I found other teen cancer patients on Twitter and got information from them. Now I use it to try to find newly diagnosed patients and help mentor them. And she described how she would essentially creep on Twitter and try to identify people who were tweeting with the hashtag newly diagnosed or cancer sucks. And she would reach out to them and say, hey, this is my name. Do you want to connect? I can support you. You're going to get through it. And that had become part of what she felt was her role as a survivor. So these were really powerful, powerful ideas that I think come from youth and come from people who are experts in using these tools. So what are some other ways that we can think about these tools for interventions? I think one way is people identifying concerns based on youth posts. Can we reach out? Can we offer resources? And who could those people be? It could be parents. If you're in the college setting, it might be your resident advisor. We hear a lot of stories that resident advisors are using these tools. It might be a peer leader. It might be a trusted adult. Almost every time I talk about this topic in the audience, someone identifies themselves as the cool aunt that everybody in the family is friends with, who knows exactly what everything is going on from where people are posting on Facebook, knows who's depressed, who's in a breakup, who's got a good job, where are things going. 
And that person might be the person to identify when posts start to look concerning. And what we found is that teens are open to this, but how they are approached is very critical. And in one study we did, led by Dr. Jennifer Whitehill, we talked with young adults about their views of if someone came and talked to them if they posted about depression. And what we found is that the majority of them said, I would want them to approach me. I put that message out there for a reason. But I want them to come and approach me in person, and I don't want to be judged. And so that was an interesting finding for us, that there was this acknowledgment that for some people, that type of disclosure is going on social media for a reason, to be able to seek help. But they want the help most often to come in the offline variety. And they want people to ask them about it. How are you doing? I saw this on Facebook. Tell me about what's going on. And for people not to make an assumption about what might be happening with them. Another area of work is thinking about automated responses. And we know that Facebook has started to work on this, partnering with the National Suicide Hotline, that if someone displays a reference to suicide, that a National Suicide Hotline can come up. We also know that on Facebook you can report people if you're worried about suicide. A lot of these mechanisms are still in process. I saw a patient about two months ago who had tried to report um, a friend, and Facebook got back to her 48 hours later to ask whether she was still concerned. So I think that these processes are on their way, but still the minivan people have it figured out better than these guys do at this point. I think there's also possibilities for keeping up with patients or clients, allowing information or supports in between visits. And you can think about this in terms of also using the power of private groups and private Facebook groups. And one story that I love is of a nurse that I know who works at a HIV summer camp for youth. And in the time in between the camps, since it's a year apart, she interacts with the adolescents in her camp group using a private group on Facebook to be able to keep each other motivated. But one lesson she shared is that you really need to be present there as a moderator. And she told a story of when one youth, um, about six months after the camp, said that he was giving up, he was done, he was going to stop taking all his meds. And she felt like she really needed to be in there in that group to keep that conversation from escalating and the other teens in the group from saying, oh, I'm going to do it too, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop too. So the presence of adult moderators, I think, is important for these types of ideas. I think sharing health education is another place where we might be able to develop some innovations. But it needs to fit the culture of these different sites. We need to understand what's the culture, what's the expectation for that site. And a colleague shared a great example with me of what she called a fail, which was a health education intervention that she placed on a men's hookup site. And the intervention didn't work. They didn't get responses. And when she talked to the participants after, they said, this site is not the culture for health education. If you would have put it on Facebook, I would have paid attention. That's a site where I go where I'm thinking about a lot of different things. This is a site where I'm only thinking about one thing. So I don't want to hear about that. And I think it gets at this idea that we need to understand how to be culturally adaptive between these sites and understand what types of information and communication are appropriate in these different spaces. So let's think about a couple take home points. Adolescents are present and engaged on social media. Social media thus offers us these new opportunities for understanding and observing adolescents within their social context. We don't have to go to the jungle to observe adolescents in their natural habitat. We just need to look at a screen. Adolescents choose to display content that represents their views, their intentions, and their behaviors on social media. And social media is influential. Much is to be learned about how to harness this and how to understand the mechanisms through which this influence might take place. But I think the overall message is of optimism that there are many opportunities for intervention and for promoting a healthy culture and healthy society using these tools. I would be remiss as a social media researcher if I did not conclude by providing you links to our social media presence. I would like to thank you all very much for being with me on this journey this evening, and I'd be happy to take any questions.